our cast was amazing. But I think one interesting anecdote about bringing on Tommy Lee, because in the beginning, we offered uh, Bobby the role of call. And he read it and said, no, I want to be Gus. And we went, wow. So we needed to find a call. Let's talk a little bit more about Lonesome Dove. Went into production in 1988 and written by Larry McMurtry because Larry McMurtry had done HUD, Last Picture Show, and in fact, Last Picture Show with Peter Bogdanovich had been so successful and Ben Johnson, of course, a roper and an actor, got his Academy Award for that film. So Bogdanovich got together with McMurtry and wanted to do an epic uh, Western that starred Henry Fonda, John Wayne, and Jimmy Stewart. And so a script was written. And because of the old guys in it, uh, they had a very difficult time. In fact, they couldn't raise the money to do this. And so it, it languished and in, until Larry McMurtry decided to turn it into a book, which became a, a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, uh, one of the greatest American novels ever written. People still read it and reread it and watch the miniseries over and over again. And when you think Westerns, you think classic Westerns, you say, it's Shane, it's Stagecoach, it's High Noon, it's The Searchers, it's The Wild Bunch, it's Lonesome Dove. Well, Lonesome Dove is the only one in that group that's not a feature film. And it is right up there with those classic feature film westerns. And the woman who discovered this and said, I'm going to make this into a series if I can, she had a music background. She really had produced some uh, Emmy winning specials. She had mentored Michael Jackson. She was a Motown executive. And she said, something about this is going to make it work. And, I, and she's here today, Suzanne DePass. How did you go about it? Because it's not something that people would normally think would happen, a, a music executive going after a Western. Well, um, I guess it was a man bites dog story at the beginning because I was vacationing with my ex-husband in, San, in um, Tucson, Arizona at a fitness resort called Canyon Ranch. And Gloria Steinem was there and she said, we're going off campus tonight because, you know, it was lots of lettuce leaves and exercise. And as soon as she said Mexican food, I said, we're in. And at that dinner were friends of hers, Larry McMurtry and a friend of his, Leslie Silco, a great author also. We hung out, we ate Mexican food, and Larry and I really hit it off. And I said to him, well, what have you got kicking around the old trunk that hasn't been produced yet? because he had also done Terms of Endearment by that time. This was like, I'm gonna say March of 85. He said, I have a book coming out in June, but you probably wouldn't be interested in it. It's a Western. And I said, au contraire, Larry. I've been a horsewoman all my life. I love Westerns. I grew up in America just like everybody else. And the romance of the West is, you know, embedded in my soul, so yes, I would be interested. So his agent, a uh, very famous agent, who went by the name of Swifty Lazar, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't call him Swifty for nothing. So they sent over the next day boxes of unbound manuscript that was the selling tool for Lonesome Dove. And I began taking a box home every night. And it, it, they arrived in my office on a flatbed trolley. I mean, nobody could carry them all. Because the book ended up being like 935 pages, and this was double-spaced. Anyway, before I finished it, I said, this is the best thing I've ever read. This is fantastic. And um, called Irving Lazar. I didn't dare call him Swifty. And um, we made a deal. And he charged me an exorbitant amount of money for an 18-month option. And I, not knowing anything about this business at the time, fresh from the record side, 
now president of Motown Productions, chartered to do film and television, said, okay. And I took $50,000 of Barry Gordy's money and sent it to Swifty Lazar, and I was in business with Lonesome Dove. Yet to be published, two days after the check cleared, one of my associates comes in and said, Suzanne, I don't know how to break this to you, but Lonesome Dove has been shopped to every studio and every network, and everyone has passed on it. And I was feeling much like the goat. Little did they know I would go from goat to goddess when, when the book won the Pulitzer Prize the following spring for fiction. And what's interesting about that to me and has guided me through the rest of my career is that you never know and you only can trust your instinct. Yeah, I know Lynn Kressel, I think, did the casting, got an Emmy uh, for that, but how, what was that process like? Was it like, we're not casting cowboys? Well, actually, when it comes to Gus and Cole, um, I'm sure everybody knows Bobby Duvall is quite the horseman. And Tommy Lee Jones has been playing polos, and then he's a Texan, and he is a cowboy. So with respect to that now, when it came to some of the others, um, I'll never forget watching Danny Glover learn how to ride. <laughs> and from the back, it looked like a runaway taxi cab with the doors open. His legs were sticking out, <laughs> and I thought, oh my god. <laughs> This ain't gonna work, but everybody's stuck with it. Um, I don't think one has to be a cowboy or cowgirl to do great work surrounded by the combination of authentically gifted and congruently cowboy folks. And as long as the heart was there and committed to it, our cast was amazing, but I think one interesting anecdote about bringing on Tommy Lee, because in the beginning, we offered uh, Bobby the role of Call. And he read it and said, no, I want to be Gus. And we went, wow. So we needed to find a Call. And we had reached out to um, Jim Garner, who had just unfortunately had a heart attack or something. He was in Hawaii. He couldn't do it. And there was this round robin of who we're going to get to play call, and oh my God, who we're going to get to play call, and every actor, either the network wouldn't approve, or this wouldn't happen, or they didn't want to do it, or. And finally, we came to Tommy Lee Jones, and I remember calling um, Kim Lamasters at CBS to say, "Great news! Tommy Lee Jones has read this and he wants to do it. He was fresh off of Executioner's Song." and not really hot at the time. And I'll never forget, Kim said to me, Suzanne, this is CBS, not PBS. <laughs> and so when you think about it, all of the sort of stumbling blocks and challenges that we collectively shared getting Lonesome Dove to the screen were so interesting because in hindsight, you'd think everybody was joined arm in arm, kumbaya, it's going to be great. The Friday before February 4th, a Sunday when it aired in 1989, not one person from CBS called us to wish us luck. This one was skiing, this other one was homesick. Nobody said a word because they were all scared out of their wits. They were so frightened about it that, and unlike most miniseries where they'd run one a week and the numbers would build, they said, you know, this is a Western, it's gonna tank. Let's just run them four nights in a row and we'll burn it off. So if it doesn't work, we won't get that hurt. Well, unbelievable. through the roof. We did a guest screening at uh, the old, um, well, what's now the Sony studio in the Cary Grant Theater. And we sent out invitations, come and spend the day in Lonesome Dove. And we figured our friends would come and people would come. We started at noon. And we went and had a dinner break and all of that kind of stuff. Only two people were gone by the time it was over. And that told us something. Anyway, when the um, show aired, needless to say, I couldn't even see past the people's behinds taking bows for what their part was in bringing Lonesome Dove to the screen. It was hilarious. But 
And they had said, if we got a 23 share of the audience, 23% of the audience, they would be happy. And so Monday morning, I'm in New York, it's like a blizzard, I'm in my hotel room, uh, two bedroom suite with my associate, Suzanne Costin, and I call Howard Stringer's office. And his assistant, male assistant at the time, was very much like Carlton the doorman. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Stringer's office. I said, oh, hello, my name is Suzanne DePass and I'm one of the executive producers on Lonesome Dove and I was just wondering if you had the numbers. Hold on, please. He comes back, he says, what was the name of that program again? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm not going back to LA, I'm gonna keep going east. <laughs> it's, it's Europe for me, it's over. And with the number 23 share in my head, he said, it's Lonesome Dove. He said, just a minute, please. He came back and said, well, last night, Lonesome Dove, over the two hours, had a 26, and I thought, oh my God, this is so great, 0.8 rating and a 48 share of the audience. Un Unprecedented, unbelievable. The Super Bowl doesn't even get those numbers now. And um, that began the unbelievable sort of national obsession with Lonesome Dove. People really loved our show. And to this day, it's just one of the great moments. It was one of the in most incredible, beautiful experiences of my life the people that I met, the experience of being kind of the only girl in the producer pool. So I was always fighting the guys, Simon Windsor and Dyson Lovell and all of the, saying that you can't take out the two little pigs following the wagon. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't take out Clara begging Gus to stay and that there's land just down the way because that's the romance of the piece. And if I was anything, I was the romance cop when it came to editing, because a lot of it... <laughs> a lot of it was, you know, heavily testosterone, and sometimes you guys just miss the point. But one of the other things that's so gratifying about Lonesome Dove, and I think the women here will bear me out, is that Lonesome Dove appealed to men and women in equal measure. And that to me was and is one of the lasting and indelible uh, results of Lonesome Dove is that it wasn't just for guys and it wasn't just for girls, it was for everyone. And that to me makes it, makes it why it stood the test of time because it wasn't just some thing relegated. Everybody got it, everybody related to it. Sometime later, uh, we did a mini-series called Buffalo Girls with um, Angelica Houston and Melanie Griffith. And I remember fighting with Jeff Sagansky. He said, well, there's no shootout and there's no cattle drive and there's no action. I said, trust me, there is action. Gabriel Byrne, the whole thing. Um, and, and it's funny because um, Liev Shriver, it was like his first job. And on his first day, he had to do a bathtub scene with Melanie Griffith. I've never seen anybody more nervous in my life, but I digress from Lonesome Dove. <laughs> anyway, Lons even Buffalo Girls shocked everybody by how well it did, and it broke other records. Speaking to the real significance of a Larry McMurtry start, because he had written the book of, of uh, Buffalo Girls also, and if you are ever so lucky as to be able to bring one of his books to the screen, do it because it just has a magical power all its own and we are all lucky to have source material like what Larry McMurtry can do. And we're all lucky to have Suzanne DePass join us today and give us a backstory. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rob Word, and I'm so glad you joined us today to watch this episode of A Word on Westerns. We have over 250 episodes up, and we've made them for people like you and for me who love Westerns. We're the only regularly scheduled talk show devoted to Westerns. 
and I want you to watch, comment, and share these episodes if you like them. All you have to do is go to this page right here, click on that, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.